So my name is Kenneth Kendler. I'm trained in psychiatry and in human statistical and molecular genetics. I have for most of my career been trying to understand the sources of genetic and environmental influences on a pretty wide range of conditions including schizophrenia, major depression, drug and alcohol abuse, and crime. When Jan and Christina Sunchrist first approached me about four years ago about the possibility of collaborating with them, as I learned more about the kinds of resources that they have been able to assemble using a wide range of Swedish registries, I became more and more excited about these opportunities. And so in the last three years, we've developed an active collaboration uh, encompassing several key projects. The first is funded by the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, and here the major focus is trying to understand how do genetic factors on the one hand and a range of environmental factors on the other contribute to this very important social problem of drug abuse. And drug abuse is a perfect example of what I would describe as a complex human disorder where we know that there are important genetic components, and this has been shown in molecular genetic studies, in twin studies, and now we have done the first adoption studies, but also social factors are very important. So people are introduced to drugs by their peers, they're encouraged to use them by social uh, factors. We know that drug abuse is related to social class. So the main focus of this project has been trying to use the wide range of registries available in Sweden to begin to dig down and understanding how genetic and environmental factors over time contribute to the etiology of drug abuse. So for example, um, there are two major ways in human studies that we try to discriminate nature from nurture. Twin studies, where we compare identical and fraternal twins, and adoption studies. There had never been an adoption study before of drug abuse, and we were able, using the records available in Sweden, to examine nearly 20,000 adoptees and were able to show that genetic risk for um, drug abuse in the biological parents of adoptees transmitted risk to the adoptive children who mostly they have never, they've never lived with. On the other hand, drug abuse in the adoptive family, and particularly disruption, so if the parents were divorced or the parents died, that increased the risk of drug abuse in the offspring. So showing that drug abuse is partly influenced by genetic factors, but the quality of our rearing environment, are our parents consistently there, are our siblings potentially involved in socially deviant behaviors, that these interact. And what we were also able to show very excitingly in this study was that the two interact with one another that the particular problem, and this has obvious implications for potential prevention, is that the people at the highest risk were those who had a high genetic vulnerability to drug abuse, and they were raised in relatively disrupted families. Those are the ones that really had an augmented risk of illness. We've done several other studies trying to look at what is it about the social environment that predisposes to drug abuse. And here we've been able to use information available in Sweden about trying to understand who was living with whom over the course of development. So we're able to show that siblings who resided together longer while they were growing up in the same household or in the same small geographical area are at higher risk for drug abuse. And we think that that's indi indexing the overall social sets of risk factors that have been important. We've also used information within sibling pairs. For example, if social factors are important in drug abuse, you would expect that siblings who are closer in age, one or two years difference, would much more likely socialize together, and if one was using drugs, it would encourage the other. While siblings that were much older, 10, 15 years difference in age, that there would be less transmission. That's exactly the kind of pattern that we found. And finally, we also showed that older siblings with drug abuse are more likely to transmit that drug abuse to their younger siblings than the reverse. Again, consistent with a lot of research showing that older siblings influence the behavior of younger siblings more than vice versa. The other major project we've been conducting is crime, and that's in a little bit earlier stage. Here we've been particularly interested in the subtypes of crime. So, so crime has uh, the most important and socially destructive part is violent criminal behavior, but there's also crime against property and white collar crime. We've begun by understanding the relationships between those, and we just have recently submitted for publication the first large scale adoption study that we've done again in Sweden, looking very much like I described for drug abuse, at the role of crime in the biological parents, at the role of crime and social disruption in the adoptive parents. And again, we found, as we have has been known, that crime is a very complex human behavior where there are important genetic vulnerabilities and important environmental effects. Again, parental divorce, 
death of a parent, even though in an adoptive design those parents are not biologically related, increase the risk along with genetic factors. Now these papers, these journals, uh, these articles have been published in some of the highest profile psychiatric journals, particularly the American Journal of Psychiatry and JAMA Psychiatry. So there's been wide recognition as we've been submitting the uh, results of this collaboration that this has been praised by a range of individuals seeing these as quite important. And this is because the kinds of level of detail that we've been able to achieve would not be possible in the United States at all. And really, there's no other Scandinavian country where the information is organized in such a way. And Jan and Christina Sundquist have been very skilled at having a group of, of um, uh, very careful statisticians and assembling these various data sets that allowed us to put them together to come to more definitive answers of these critical questions that we have before. Now, importantly, what's the clinical impact of this? Well, most of this research is trying to understand etiology. And I have throughout my career been convinced that what we need in psychiatry is a much better understanding of the etiology of these conditions. And as we know from the rest of medicine, as you understand more about the etiology of the conditions, the possibility for intervention, prevention, and treatment are greater. For example, as I said before, already we have been able to identify some of the social factors that may particularly contribute to drug abuse on the one hand and to crime on the other, and have been able to show that if you are wanting to try to intervene, the group in society that is at highest risk are those that have effectively a double hit those that come with a high temperamental predisposition to crime and to those that are then likely to be exposed to deviant environments. And interventions targeted towards those people would be the most effective use of limited resources in being able to reduce rates of subsequent drug abuse or crime when they reach adulthood.